This is the Gospel Revolution. Since you're knocking on the door, you're begging to come in, yeah. Unaware that all the wild love's been knocking from within. You are the love you see. A perfect day you need, right? Here's the founder and president of the Gospel Revolution, Michael Lilborn Williams. Hello, Daniel. Da- Daniel. Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, we started this one off right. Hey, Daniel Thomas Rouse. How are you, Michael Lilborn Williams? Uh, it's a beautiful day here in Clarksville, and I'm sure that that place where you live is. Yeah, let's see. In the frozen tundra, I think we're. Ooh. We're actually 50 degrees today. Wow. <laughs> I think yesterday it was about 30 degrees this time of the day. Yeah, 50 degrees is my hibernation. <laughs> <laughs> well, winter's coming. I um, cleared off my patio and raked my leaves and got all the summer stuff put away. So, um, Oh, my. We are full-blown, ready to go. Now that we're... We're thoroughly depressed. Let's continue. <laughs> Let's get some good news. <laughs> Goodness, Michael, the information has just been uh, almost overwhelming that's been coming our way regarding the 1,000-year reign of Christ. Well, Daniel, it is uh, nothing but the truth. We are on session 15, if I'm not mistaken. That is correct. Session 15, and I still don't know where it's going to end. I know that online I've tried to provoke people with a couple of things. Like I put down like five things. Of course, this one person uh, was posting that the thousand year reign was metaphorical and, and that, um, you know, it's just whatever you want it to be, whenever you want it to be. And he reigns forever. And he could prove because it said he reigns forever. And I said, yeah, but the first part of it said he would reign for a thousand years. And then he would begin to reign forever. Uh, uh, so uh, anyway, and that, but but I put down the five things, and just of course, there's no consideration for it at all. And uh, then uh, I said, so well, one time, my, the thousand year reign is mentioned one time. Show me one more place. And it's like, uh, yeah, there's six altogether. <laughs> <laughs> And I begin to wonder how many times does some, does the scriptures have to say something for it to be true? It's mm. like, you know, it only declares one time in the uh, in our Constitution that all are created equal. Well, why the hell should we pay attention to that? It only says it one time, <laughs> mm, right? Well, and then let alone the fact those six times appear in the Revelation, but. Um, how many times is that story repeated and the time frame repeated over yeah. and over and over again? I mean, that's what the last 15 uh, episodes have been about. Yeah. Uh, we've talked. Uh, so that's probably 15, uh, almost 20 hours then. 20 hours. I'd say there's 20 hours there. Yeah. Of us talking about something that doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe, Michael, that would be a good thing for us to look at today is um, answering that question, is the thousand years metaphorical? Um, perhaps maybe we could look at some other prophecies that have time frames on it. Um, and then, again, I don't think it would hurt to revisit the validity of the Hebrew Scriptures and uh, why that we can trust the Hebrew Scriptures. Um, but before we do that, we want to give a big thank you to everybody for participating in the pledge drive. Uh, we are coming to the end here, but I think we still got some work to do, don't we? Uh, yes, we do. I have work to do. I just, uh, and if anybody's noticed, they've not gotten any phone calls yet. It's just, uh, I, I can't tell you why, but if you would like to call me, if you've not gotten your call, please call at 832-318-9339. We've had a couple of people who've stepped up 
that listened to the show that uh, where we were telling about Don giving his last $5,000 into the gospel revolution. And we've had people call in to give one-time gifts that were uh, uh, more than uh, they normally ever gave. Uh, I can't say more than they've ever given, but this was, if this was a good, two good contributions, but uh, nowhere near what we need to put us over the top. And uh, then we've had some PayPal. Uh, there's been some uh, guys that's visited PayPal, uh, a couple hundred dollars, uh, two or three cases, a uh, uh, hundred dollars and uh, things like that uh, outside of people's normal. So uh, I would say of the 25,000 that we really need to put us over the top, we have a about uh, around 75% left to, uh, so we've only had about 25% of that to come in. Mm. If you can help us, uh, we're we're in dire need, and we we appreciate anything that you can do uh, to help keep the gospel moving forward. Uh, Of course, as Michael said, you can give him a call. Um, If you want to go online, you can also do that at gospelrevolution.com and hit the donate button. And uh, you'll find the information that you need is readily available. I got the gospel in me. I got the gospel in me. I got the gospel in me. Yeah. I got the gospel in me. I got the gospel in me. I got the gospel in me. It's the Gospel Revolution Pledge Drive. Here's how it works. You pledge. And we drive the gospel onto devices in over 185 countries. Go to gospelrevolution.com and pledge today. So, yeah, Daniel, you've uh, uh, mentioned, I think I kind of brought up some things we should have held our, as they say, our powder dry until later. But uh, um, uh, being able to do that is not one of my uh, particular uh abilities so uh yeah this has been uh so interesting to try to get some reflection back but uh the inability to think outside of your pre-millennial your your millennial mindset yeah everyone has a millennial mindset and some of you do and you don't even know you got one right. because of the church you're in their whole doctrine is based on a millennial perception. And uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, preterists, which are uh, most of these guys are our friends. But uh, there's some that, uh, man, they're, I, I, maybe it's been as a result of the teaching. And uh, they're posting quite a bit about preterism. <laughs> and it all being finished in uh, 70 AD and how that, that totally set them free, which I understand how it set them free. Mm-hmm. Because if you truly believed everything was finished at 70 AD, that means you don't have any futuristic doctrines. Now, not all of preterism that declares 70 AD to be the finish has a freedom from law. They don't have a freedom from uh, futuristic prophecies either. But there are some preterists that do. So it was a major step for them. I can imagine coming back from having some post-millennial or uh, pre-millennial view and or even an amillennial view that is floating around all over the place uh, to have a point which is only uh, 35 years too late. (laughs) Right, yes. Now, the problem is that... That 35 years is taking away from the prophetic uh, fulfillment of what Jesus said, that he came to fulfill all scriptures. Mm. There is no indication. And then the, finally, the thing that we came across was uh, I was sitting thinking about it, and I thought, wait a minute. So Jesus, they, they would acknowledge that Jesus said, you know, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up. So the temple was raised up. So the problem we have now is uh, something that is completely out of scriptural uh, context. 
we have two temples existing at the same time for 35 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, That is the eternal temple and the one here. Uh, So uh, I've done all the research that I know how to do in asking, even including AI. And I said, so with this being Christ, how would this old temple and the things that Jesus said, how would this affect the, the temple itself? And even AI said it just makes it irrelevant. It, I said if it was still standing today, it would still have no bearing on how the scriptures were fulfilled at the cross. Mm-hmm. So I was encouraged by that. I was wondering what AI would have to say about it. Uh, and uh, not that we rely on AI for everything that we think, but it's just certainly good to have something that has all of this information available that I don't have access to. And is it as good as Google? Oh, honey, if all you've been doing is Googling, you don't even know a whole new world exists. <laughs> a whole new world. I know. We <laughs> seem to be always back at that song. <laughs> yeah, Michael, this is this is very interesting to understand these um these times that have been laid out. So just for a review sake, uh, last week, the last two weeks actually, we spent on the 70 weeks of Daniel. And to clarify uh, why the 70 weeks is actually interpreted as 490 years is because it's 70 sets of seven. So 70 sets of seven years would be 490 years. Where do we get that from? That's the Hebrew language. If you look up the Hebrew words, uh, it literally means uh, 70 sets of seven. Um, And virtually every researcher agrees with that. And AI agrees with that definition of Hebrew. Yeah, and even the the Christian um, guys who study this out and and yes. postpone the last week or the last yeah. half of the week, uh, they also agree. Um, everyone who looks at it agrees that this is four hundred ninety years. But so you know how we came to that, and it is substantiated in the Hebrew language that that would be uh, seventy sets of seven. And it tells us the exact year that it begins. Exactly. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it began in the year when King somebody uh, uh, initiated the reconstruction of the temple. Yeah. Yeah. When uh, King Cyrus allowed the Jews to go back uh, to Jerusalem and start rebuilding their city. Um, That was after the Babylonian exile. Yeah. And uh, so we we looked at that and we followed that time frame from that time when King Cyrus allowed the Jews to return and followed the timeline of the breakdown in the 70 weeks of Daniel, uh, these 490 years. Yeah. And it each period led us right up to the birth and the ministry and then the death, burial and resurrection of Christ. I mean, it, mm-hmm. it precisely. Uh, yes. And the only thing that was missing was three and a half years. And that three and a half years is where a lot of people lose, get confused. And uh, it's quite simple if you just keep reading and read in context, because the prophecy of Daniel says that it'd be cut off. Yeah. And uh, Jesus, when he was describing this prophecy by Daniel, said that unless these days be shortened, you would end yeah. up like Sodom and you would end up like Gomorrah. Uh, prophet Isaiah prophesied that these days would be cut short and cut short in righteousness. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's it's just, it's a beautiful, beautiful picture that we were prevented from experiencing the great tribulation and all of the wrath and anger and all of that. Uh, Michael painted a beautiful picture of that with all of this judgment just swirling up around uh, the Mount of Olives as Jesus hung on the cross. And then we went through John chapter, I'm preaching, man. We went through John you chapter You are nine. indeed. I'm listening to <laughs> We went through John chapter 12, excuse me, where all of he drew all of that judgment. And I think we looked at that word drew and it means to almost like force it. He forced Drag it, it. To drag it. He dragged it. <laughs> he dragged it, it, it. He drug it to himself and took all of that upon us. And by doing that, he cut off that last three and a half years of terrible, terrible judgment and wrath and all of that being poured out upon mankind. And Jesus took that all for us. Woo! Oh, uh, yeah, and uh, beautiful preaching Sunday morning. It's time to take up the offering and <laughs> get people into heaven now. Uh, no, beautiful, uh, Daniel. And uh, 
uh, and it it made Jesus' statement in John 12 even clearer to me. Because, see, the great tribulation was the judgment yeah. of God that was coming to the whole world. Mm-hmm. And Jesus said, now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hello, we're we are interrupting this program <laughs> to bring yes. you a special broadcast. We are now moving the last three and a half years of the judgment of God to now. Mm. Now is the judgment. Mm-hmm. It's not going. Uh, uh, we tricked you. We had you waiting for uh, another three and a half years. However, now and you know what, Daniel? When we looked up that word and it said to drag. Yeah, and then all I could see was Jesus dragging that cross mm. to that two kilometers, two miles. Remember that was just such a big deal. Yeah. It's, I mean, we found that in the scriptures. But I think that every all those two miles, uh, Jesus was dragging uh, the uh, mm. the uh, judgment to the cross with him. Uh, there's such a strong, beautiful typology there. Uh, as he was dragging that cross, he was dragging the last thir- three years of world history on his back to be placed on the cross. Yeah, and he drug it out of the temple. They started to the temple, and he God drug right. it out of there. And where did he go? To the holy place. Went to the Mount of Olives. Michael, you clarified that that holy place was not the temple. All of this didn't happen at yeah. the temple. It happened on the Mount of Olives. Yeah, you can't leave the holy place and wind up two miles away in the holy place. Mm. <laughs> uh, so we know he left the temple. So we know it was not the holy place. Yeah. Uh, because that's where he left from. And uh, then it becomes very clear where the holy place is. You know, it's like chat GPT. You have arrived. <laughs> <laughs> Memory update. Yep. So, uh, th- folks, if if this is uh, boring to you, uh, just please go ahead and turn it off. You don't have to listen at all. But uh, I've, I've been doing this 55 years, folks. And... Uh, uh, 55 years ago, I was walking the beaches of Clearwater, Florida, uh, trying to uh, get people to understand that if they didn't accept Jesus, they were going to go to hell forever. Mm. Uh, uh, everything that I have believed, I have put action behind. Include sell everything that you have and give it away because it's so nothing. Compared, what are you going to do? What's what's more valuable, a man's soul, or you know whether or not you have a job? And uh, I did. I you know turned. I surrendered my car. I uh, I I what look. I might. I, I surrendered my underwear. Mm. Uh, goodness gracious! I had nothing, and nothing that any of them had said that any man said that it was his own. I lived that life. Mm. I lived that life. Uh, we considered a job to be an eight-hour day, so this was our job, which one's more important. And I lived this way uh, during the very first part of my 55 years in the ministry. That's how I started ministry, uh, was walking uh Believe me, after that day, I never went out without my flip flops on. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I've altered my lifestyle to fit whatever it was I was um, uh, uh, believing at the time. But I've not altered my lifestyle to, I, I've not altered anything in understanding the gospel. Now, the gospel is altering how I think. It is offer altering uh, two major things. Number one, how I relate to me has been altered drastically. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, uh, uh, you, you have to learn to negotiate with yourself. You know, you're going around negotiating with yourself all day long. Well, I wouldn't do that. Well, if I was me, if that was me, well, I would... Well, what would I do if this or that? So you see, we all negotiate with ourselves all day long. What am I going to do about this? What am I going to do about that? 
Well, if you don't know who you are, how in the world are you going to negotiate and come up with what's best for you if you don't even know who you are? Mm. Well, the issue is that we can tell every one of you who you are, and you can set your navigation from this point. You are holy, righteous, perfect, without fault, without blame in Christ. So we know who you are, and we know exactly where you are. To find your way through life in navigation, you see, uh, GPS needs to know uh, uh, where you are. Now, you need to know who you are. And uh, GPS needs to know where you are. If you know who you are and where you are, you can navigate around and in between or with any object that comes in your way and get to the place you're wanting to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I didn't do that to me. The gospel did that to me. And I will be forever grateful for my navigation abilities and my navigation abilities with myself, as I said, is, are done in perfect peace without worry and all of these things. Because why would I do all of that if I know who I am and where I am at every moment? And if I need to navigate with, around, or in between, or, or over, or under, others, then my navigation system will carry that out perfectly. Mm -hmm. I don't even have to be concerned about it. So um, that's the difference between 55 years ago and now. Yeah, really a beautiful transition. You know, Michael, you talked about um, that everyone has a, a view of the millennium and you're living yeah. in, in some aspect of that, you know, pre, post, mid, a millennial. Um, and, and really that, that is that place where you are. And yeah. if you have positioned yourself and the millennium is yet to happen, the thousand year reign of Christ is yet to happen. The last week of Daniel is yet to happen. Then, uh, you're going to adjust your worldview. You're going to adjust Absolutely. your, your decisions. Uh, um, I, uh, one of the big things that I did is I mishandled money because of my position in my mind of of the millennial reign of Christ. Isn't that amazing? And so you make decisions in life based on that, but by understanding that this is something that was done, it was a literal 1,000 year period from the time that King David took the throne until the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. When you understand that that fulfilled all of those prophecies within that time frame. And what a beautiful story it's been painting when you understand the fulfillment of that and, and what that does in your mind is it repositions you, it repositions your GPS yeah. to a place where I can live out of the finished work of Christ yeah. rather than trying to finish the work of Christ. And you're working in the fulfillment of that prophecy rather than looking forward to it. And, and, and to say that it changes your outview on life is a great understatement. Well, yeah, and you know, and 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 sticking with this metaphor we're speaking of and this issue of GPS, I mean, how in the world can you navigate where you want to go when you don't even know where you are? Come on. Yeah. You know, I remember doing this long before GPS came out. I was sitting in the living room of some friends of mine and uh uh uh, he was uh, very one of them, very highly educated and educated in a sense, and from a family that just didn't go for all that spiritual stuff. But he was just stayed confused all the time. It was just unbelievable, and the depression and the uh, the whole list of things, anxieties, and so I couldn't really speak in biblical terms to because I knew he was wasn't open to it, and so I. I told him, it's, it's been many decades ago, and I told him, that, uh, David, I remember his name. I said, David, I said, so we're sitting here in your living room. And it was kind of a, a step-down living room into, mm -hmm. and the uh, from where I was sitting, the door was across that step-down, step up onto kind of the hallway, 
and then walk down to the door and front door, nice big front doors and open the door and go out. He was sitting to my right facing the kitchen. And I said, so, David, you've got to know where you are to move forward in life. And he said, what do you mean? I said, what if, what if you told me how to get to the front door from your perspective? Mm. You would tell me, okay, so what you do is you stand up and you turn right. And then you uh, walk about four steps and you turn left. And then you walk about five more steps and you turn right and right there's the door. Now, if I took your instructions from where you are and I stood up and I turned to the right, I'd walk straight into the wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those are your instructions. Mm -hmm. That's how you would get there. But I, I said, I would have no clue of, of getting, and I, I'm sitting there, I'm looking at the door. If I had a misconception of where I was, I couldn't even make it to what I see. Exactly. So a lot of you are listening, and I've just described your freaking life. You can see the door, and you can't get there. Mm -hmm. You can see what you need, and you can't get there. You can see what needs to be done, and you can't get there. But it's not because you're inept or you're uh, unqualified or you're a screw up. It's the fact that you've never learned who and where you actually are. Mm. And that's our big thing here. We don't try to tell people what to do. I don't tell you, try to tell you which way to go, how to do it, when to do it. And people that have a propensity to do that don't really, they can't hang very long with the gospel revolution. Because they're, they are addicted to these things. Mm -hmm. And so they have to move on. It's got to be a personal revelation, a personal insight. And they're still running into doors. They're still running into walls. They're still mm -hmm. stepping off the balcony. And they have no clue why. Wow. Michael, that, that is a great visual. And, and from that point, if, if you just say, look at the thousand year reign of Christ, if you are looking into the Bible, and the Hebrew scriptures, and you're looking from the standpoint of the thousand year reign is yet to come. Yeah. And you build all the doctrines around that, then everything is askewed. And that's why, yeah. by making this adjustment and now looking at the doctrines and seeing it as a fulfilled uh, thousand year reign of Christ, now the doctrines fit into place. Yeah. And you don't have to twist and, and contort. Uh, that was one of the things I mentioned to you last night is all of this has come so easy now. Yeah, yeah. When when we understood, came to the conclusion that the thousand year reign of Christ concluded at the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and started at uh, the enthronement of King David, as we saw that everything else began to just psh, fall into place. It really was amazing. Yeah, and, uh, you know, pertaining to some of these other verses that uh, actually in Hebrews and in Peter that seem to place this uh, enthronement after the cross, all of the other verses, they collide with that mm. because Jesus makes a very strong case and Paul that, uh, so this is supposed to be him seated at the right hand of the Father. But Jesus explains, me in you, you in me, I in them, they in us. Wow. Whose right hand are you at now? <laughs> yeah. So logistics, 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 location, location, location. Mm. So you see, out of the mouth of Christ himself, he eliminated this right hand waiting period. Because regardless of what you think about it, the right hand of God is in a position waiting for. Mm. It is waiting for. Yeah. And then when Jesus starts to explain in his final days, this is what's just about to happen. Mm -hmm. Me and you, you and them, they and us, we all together. And then Revelation comes in. And explains that behind the scene, almost mystical view of everything, of how that everything comes together 
and uh, in the throne, and, and the term in the throne, not next to the throne or any of that shows up. It's mm. in the throne, mm-hmm. and and in the throne is where we are, God are, <laughs> where uh, Jesus is, and all of that descends to a place to where heaven and earth have come together. Wow. This is really amazing. You know, Michael, let's look at that amillennial perspective there for a second. What the amillennial view is, is it could be a metaphorical 1,000 years. Yes. So that means it could be a year. It could be forever and ever, as the gentleman you were talking to. Uh, it could be eternal. Um, it could be something that doesn't really happen. It could be as the mystics kind of think, you know, well, it's just a, a mindset kind of thing. Yeah. Um, that's where that's painted. But Michael, one of the things that we have been stressing ab- about understanding the Hebrew scriptures is in the prophecies, when they prophesy a period of time, mm-hmm. the Hebrew scriptures have held true to those prophecies. To the specific day. Exactly. Not just, nothing general at all. Mm-hmm. Case in point, the 70 weeks of Daniel, yeah. uh, which is 490 years. The 490 years prophesied by Daniel to the very day that they started building Jerusalem up until that in the middle of the week was exactly the time period that was laid out in the prophecy of Daniel. Yeah, but Daniel, it's that last three and a half years now, you know? (laughs) And, you know, that's what Daniel's been trying to show us is that the same problem. Now, if it had been some other guy speaking up about it, like, Mm -hmm. okay, you got question to questions. But when you got the same prophet saying the prophecy that I just prophesied about 70 weeks ending in a seven year period that's divided in three and a half and three and a half, uh, what's going to happen is in the middle of that seven uh, years is uh, we're going to cut off that last three and a half years. (laughs) It's all going to be absorbed in the body of the messiah you have jesus saying now is the judgment of the world Mm -hmm. Uh, and if those days hadn't been shortened no flesh would be saved why because that was the judgment that's the great tribulation yeah the great tribulation even christians know that it is so great and so profound and so worldwide deadly that they created a rapture because if you're here you're going down yeah you ain't making it you ain't making it if you're here. Mm-hmm. So they created a rapture that pulls us out of here and that we get to escape just before. And then the others say, well, no, no, no. We got to go through the great tribulation. And before, you know, we've got to go through the first three and a half years of it and uh, uh, through three and a half years. And before the final end of it, we get caught up. Uh, because we've been protected while all this destruction is going on. The thing they've confused is, is the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, beginning with the ministry of Christ to the cross. Mm. That is, a, a, a folks, read the story, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you don't call that tribulation, I don't know what you'd call. For the Israel uh, nation of Israel, for Jerusalem, this was a tribulation, but it wasn't what, the Daniel the prophet spoke of is boy after this three and a half years great tribulation has started Mm -hmm. so these folks have have done everything with this last three and a half years except except what the prophet who prophesied it said was going to happen to the last three and a half years of absolute cataclysmic destruction of all flesh Mm -hmm. And then Jesus said, yeah, okay. Uh, I had to talk with the Father. I really, is this man, this taking this full, whoo, Lordy, Lordy, you want me to take all of this three and a half years of tribulation into my own body? Mm-hmm. Uh, can we have a talk about it? Can we drink over it for a minute? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm looking into this cup of wrath. This, mm-hmm. this, this, I'm looking into a cup full of three and one half years. I'm looking into a cup mm. full of three and a half years of the most treacherous time that's ever been in, in the history of the world. Every person, every person 
And that's the reason I was thinking about this the other day. Let them as in Judea not, not seek to flee or anything else. Because Jesus was still talking about the, the great tribulation getting ready to come. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fact of it is, it weren't going to come. But sticking with the timeline, uh, it's too late, folks. These are the signs that the tribula great tribulation is. Therefore, don't, you know, if you're in the rooftop, just stay there because mm -hmm. it ain't going to help you come down. If you're, you know, if you're uh, uh, breastfeeding your kid, no need to run. Uh, don't need to change anything because three and a half years of absolute indignation of God is about to be poured out. So nobody needs to go anywhere when you see this, because this is when the great tribulation has started. The thing of it is, is that Jesus followed that timeline all the way up until Daniel said that the rest of that was cut off. He was informing the people though, as though it were not going to be cut off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it had not at that point been cut off. Right. So here Jesus is holding this cup and seeing swirling it around, you know. And, uh, you know, like you do when you're getting ready to drink a good glass of wine, you sniff it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you swirl it around to see the swirl and the, and the bouquet and all of this. Well, all Jesus saw was three and a half years of absolute excruciating tribulation mm -hmm. and, he, and he prayed daniel he said father is there any way this three and a half years can pass from me having to take it but father says no this is the only plan we got son but it's still your choice mm -hmm. okay I'll do it. Mm. And after Jesus dragged that three and a half year tribulation to the cross with the cross on the cross and put it on the cross and drank it all on the cross, people are still looking for the last three and a half years of that prophecy. Yeah. All fulfilled as stated in the death, burial and resurrection. If you needed any other time frame to fit that, you have the 1,000 year reign, which ends on the exact same day. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. You know, Michael, there's another period of time. Now, this would be uh, 70 years right before the 70 weeks of Daniel began, the 490 years of Daniel. And that is the 70 years of exile in Babylon, uh, which was actually prophesied by Jeremiah in Jeremiah 25 and 29. That they that uh, the children of Israel would be in Babylonian exile for seventy years. Yeah. Well, guess how long it was until King Cyrus said that they could go back to Jerusalem. Um, let's see, six years, eleven months, and twenty nine days. No, seventy years. Uh. Just as it was stated, it was like. The prophets got it right, Michael. You sure it wasn't 69 or 68? No, it wasn't 69 and a half. It wasn't 68. <laughs> it wasn't 340. <laughs> it was Now, and there's no years. place there that says, well, okay, this is prophesied and at the end of it, but I'm going to cut the last off. So right. there's none of that. Right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Because the only one that would have the authority to change, the, and, and it wouldn't be a change. This would be uh, what happened with the 70 weeks of Daniel was to bring home the true nature of what Christ did. Mm. And you silly ass mystics and everybody else out there saying, oh, no, that wasn't God's plan. No, God never do that. I, I'm telling you, you've missed the gospel by a trillion miles, mm -hmm. a trillion miles. Because it was God through Daniel. Uh, I was just going through some things about the, the Hebrew scriptures. And uh, it's like, so who told Moses this stuff? And uh, it's God himself told Moses. God said, Moses told me. On the mountain, God's talking to uh, Moses, telling Moses exactly what to do. So, uh, folks, if the author 
which you don't believe in. Uh, you just have a religion. You don't. Uh, you, I, they really want to hold on to the name Christianity too. So let them hold on to it. Uh, however, uh, this time frame, this powerful cutting into Daniel, you blew my mind. You changed my life when we were doing that show, and suddenly you started quoting the rest of the story. Mm. And uh, about that three and a half years being cut off and it all just fell. In. And since then we've done intensive research and it is absolutely true that that's the case. Mm. So here we have 70 years that God said they were going to be in bondage in Babylon, right? Yep. Uh, and I don't know how, how long before that, but some time before that, that uh, he prophesied that that was going to happen. These prophecies in Jeremiah, which there are two of them, uh, Jeremiah 25, 11, and 12, and Jeremiah 29, 10, which says that this would happen during King Nebuchadnezzar, which this mm. prophecy would have taken place about 19 years before they were actually exiled into Babylon. Wow. So uh, uh, almost a full 20 years before it happened. It prophesied who uh, under which king and uh also i mean how could they prophesy which king was going to be alive right time? exactly I mean, they prophesied that but they also prophesied it was going to last for 70 years and uh daniel was there any other prophet that spoke about this so we've got 20 years before that it became specific this is the year it will start and this is the year it will end yeah, um, the prophet Isaiah prophesied almost 100 years before Jeremiah. Wow. Uh, the only thing you don't get in the prophecy by Isaiah is the specific 70-year exile. Well, that's 100 years from now. We'll wait 80 years. Yeah. Until exactly. <laughs> then we'll give you all the, all the juicy details. <laughs> we'll update you in 80 years. So. <laughs> Amazing, Michael. And, and again... What's the point of us sharing this is 70 years is 70 years. A thousand years is a thousand years. 490 years is 490 years, unless it says that the last three and a half years was going to be cut off. Yeah. The precision, the precision of the prophecies, mm. the precision of the prophets, precision of the fulfillment of all of these things. Michael, there's more. Uh, what about the 400 years of bondage in Egypt? This was a prophecy in Genesis 15, 13, and 14. God tells Abraham and his descendants that they'll be enslaved and oppressed mm -hmm. for 400 years. Well, you fast forward the story to Exodus 12, 40, 41. You see that Israel uh, sojourned in Egypt. How long? 400, 400 years. years. This is the one that I got to see a 22-year-old man come unglued at. Because uh, we were watching a uh, a documentary with uh, Hebrew scholars, <laughs> well noted on film, Hebrew scholars, and uh, they, these are Jewish people, and they are scholars of their own scriptures. And one of them spoke up and says, "You know, uh, yeah, I'm not too impressed. I mean, God, God." Uh, God has them, they're in bondage for 400 years, and then all of a sudden he says, I hear your cry, I'm coming to rescue you. Mm -hmm. It's like, well then, why didn't you, uh, why did it take you 400 years, God? Here is a Hebrew scholar, and a 22-year-old almost comes out of his chair, comes out of his chair and says, what? You don't even uh, know that it was prophesied? That they would be there. Mm. So, Daniel, uh, where where is the prophecy about this? You've told us that there was a prophecy, but you failed to tell us where the prophecy was. So, you're going to have to fill us in a little more. Oh, I'm so sorry for my inadequacies. <laughs> I know your inadequacies. 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 <laughs> I love I love catching you when you even do that. my language is inadequacy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving right along, that would be Genesis chapter 15 and verse 13. 
Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Wow. So this was, uh, goodness, uh, he was still Abram at this time. Yeah. And, you know, Michael, I remember that Joseph was in Egypt. So we have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph. So we have Abram, who became Abraham. His son was Isaac. His son was Jacob. And then his son was Joseph. So I know we got like four generations here that has passed before this even happened. Uh, But God speaking to Abram uh, about this people, and he told them that they were going in bondage and exactly how long they'd be there. So this must have been, what, two, three hundred years before a prophecy, before it actually happened? Uh, Yeah, it'd have to be three hundred years by any calculation uh, at, at the lower end. So the, I think the problem here is that we don't know, at least it hasn't been identified yet, exactly what year they went into bondage to Egypt. But now we do know, we should be able to figure it out because I think we do know when they came out of bondage. Mm. So, um, uh, but yeah. So anyway, the prophecy is very clear. Uh, some two to three hundred generations should let's just say three or four or more generations before this prophecy came uh then came this bondage yeah so they went into bondage for 400 years wow yeah you know this all happened during the promise that god was giving abram before he was abraham and we know that uh Abraham, he was an old man before he had Isaac, and yeah. uh, then he had Isaac, and then Isaac had Jacob, and then Jacob had a Joseph, which was his youngest son, and uh, then Joseph's brothers um, sold him to the Egyptians, and then Joseph raised up the ladder. So you are talking about a lot of history that has taken place between this time of this prophecy and the time that... Um, the the Israelites were in bondage to Egypt. You know, if you're going to get a brand new name, you know, like Saul became Paul. He was kind of in the prime of his life. Yeah. Uh, you know how old Abraham was when he got his new name? How old? 99. <laughs> it's like, gee, God, thanks for the new name. <laughs> My name's Abraham. Clunk, guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, that shows you God keeps his promises. Mm. may not be in your time. But <laughs> mm. Yeah, that'll preach. <laughs> Boy, won't it, though? Um, it would have nothing to do with us, but it would preach. Yes. Yeah. So, Michael, we have the 400 years uh, bondage to... Egypt. We have the 70 years of bondage to Babylon. We have the 490 years of Daniel, aka the 70 weeks of Daniel. We have the thousand year reign of Christ. And to this point, all of these, the the Hebrew scriptures have proven that the time frame is correct precisely. Um, There's another one, Michael, that I remember hearing a lot of in the word of faith, and that is the 120 years of man. Oh, the promise from God that man would live 120 years. I think that was made popular by the uh, (laughs) great Kenneth Copeland. Uh, And he hasn't changed his mind yet uh, as of uh, just a year ago. Um, I I remember, uh, and of course, I was exposed to that also. You heard it. Uh, all your Rhema t- teachers agreed with it. You know, God promised us 120 years. And uh, so 
I was uh, intrigued by that. This has been decades ago. Now, this is decades ago. So I thought, uh, what in the world? Uh, God promised man 120 years. So I went back and I read the context of it. And I read the context and the context. And then as I was reading, I realized that the flood happened exactly 120 years after he said, and man's years shall be 120. Oh, my God. And it's like, what? What? Are you kidding me? This is not a promise of long life. This is a promise of everybody's going to die. Mm. <laughs> wow. Now, you talk about turning a prophecy on its head. Now, has uh, now uh, Kenneth Copeland was preaching this uh, 40 years ago. And uh, uh, is he so closed off from anybody outside of his circles that nobody's told him you're making a frick fracking freaking fool of yourself? Mm. Well, as of June the 11th, 2023, he was not. He was still doing it. He went. I, I listened to the video. I thought I've got to hear this. So, and see, we do listen to these guys. And he went in, told a story about his poor little old mama, and has mama. The remember getting the call one day, called her and say, "Woo, Kenneth, woo!" I, I oh, she was rejoicing and rejoicing. Uh, mama, what's happened? She said, "I just she had turned seventy every." And she said, I made it to the promise that man's years shall be 70 to 80 years. And, oh, she was excited. And then later on, I found out God promised us 120. She said, but, you know, my mama didn't know that. So she only lived seven more years. So she didn't know to claim that promise of 120. So she died seven years after that. Like it was this big tragedy at mm -hmm. 77 to die because she had 120. Uh, let me assure you, Kenneth Copeland is not going to be alive uh, at 120. <laughs> I mean, the, uh, there have been people that have lived that long. Uh, in fact, I saw one article that the guy, you know, they've got people that's lived longer than 120 years. Mm -hmm. And he actually went in and was trying to prove these people were lying because they couldn't possibly have lived past the time that God gave me. <laughs> so he was arguing against people who had been documented and they, they found out she was lying. They found the documents were wrong. They found out this case. That. He just went through and disproved every document mm. uh, because the promise was not only a promise of at least 120, it says man's year shall be 120. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, but then he, I mean, uh, he has no explanation for the uh, uh, Noah and all these guys living over 900 years. Right. So it's like the confusion out there is just piled upon piles of piles. Mm hmm. Now, uh, again, Daniel has posed the question, why are we doing this? Folks, it is so vitally important that you know this piece of information. It will give you the framework within which to think about all Bible prophecy, about law, and about gospel. Mm. These three subjects cannot be understood. Law cannot be understood outside of the 1,000-year reign and the 70 weeks of Daniel. The righteousness cannot be understood. He will cut it short in righteousness. righteousness. Uh, uh, the kingdom of God cannot be understood unless you understand these two prophecies. Uh, redemption, salvation, uh, the uh, uh, Daniel chapter 9, all uh, law. And the way it puts it there, it says sin. Uh, I remember studying it. I can't say it exactly the way it is, but I remember because it says transgression and sin, and it shall be ceased. One of them actually means the noun sin, the trans the transgression of Adam will be erased, mm. and all disobedience to the law will be erased. Mm. So both of those are in 
the ninth chapter of Daniel. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, if, if sin has been erased at the cross, what is God tribulating for? Mm -hmm. Come on. You know, what's the judgment for? What's the judgment for? And I remember, as I said, I've walked into this gospel backward, blindfolded through the back door. And I've slowly taken off my blindfolds. I've slowly bumped into things. I thought, I better look and see where I am. Mm. But I'm telling you, uh, I, I have no better description. I did not walk in the front door. I did not walk in uh, with my eyes open. I w walked in the uh, the back door. I walked in backward. I walked in blindfolded. And that's where I came from in understanding the gospel. Wow. Until I stopped and took the blindfolders off, and it's like, oh my gosh, look where we are. Mm. And that's what Daniel's explaining to you is this unveiling, if you will. We backed into it, and now it is just, it is unbelievable what's happening around us. Mm. But this uh, desperate attempt to hold on to this a millennial, give us, give us all of them now, including the preterist view, Daniel. Yeah, the a millennial, pre millennial, post millennial, of course, pan millennial, those who don't even know oh, yeah, <laughs> what they're well, talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think the preterists, they kind of fall into the a millennial because of um, if, if it's all fulfilled in AD 70 for a full preterist, then, yeah. um, you know, it's not a literal thousand years. It is not a literal thousand. Years. Uh, but the partial preterists, they will fall into those different camps too because they still see some future fulfillment. Uh, and they're either pre post or mid, you know, it just depends on who you talk to. Yeah. They're just as well, divided as the rest of Christianity is. Exactly. 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 I, I got me before you, you reap what you sow, brother. <laughs> I sow on what I reap. Uh, <laughs> that's why we're taking you through this precision to those of you that's boring your socks off. Uh, you need to get on board. And you need to listen mm. because these are the things that must be settled for you to have a, a any chance of perceiving what you're reading and the context of it. Yeah. My goodness. Michael, and these are just a couple examples of prophecies. I mean, I think we could probably do a whole series on biblical prophecies that have been fulfilled exactly the way they said they were. Of course, we focused on ones that had timestamps on them, um, which is really cool. <laughs> Again, yeah. the precision. Uh, but you could build all of that because these prophecies, you know, like the one with King Nebuchadnezzar, that this is going to yeah. be during the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. It named names uh, yeah. 20 years before it ever even happened. I mean, you show me a prophet today that would do anything close to that. Yeah. And and they fail time and time and time again. Yeah. And we are not including the prophecies like that. Okay. So next week you're going to go and you're going to run into this guy and he's going to say, right. And you're going to say, we, we didn't do any of those. Mm -mm. Uh, and it's filled with those. Yeah. And um, so there's a lot of short term prophecies. The reason we're sticking with these long term prophecies is because the two we've presented to you are the longest mm -hmm. of these prophecies. Yeah. And uh, are the, does anyone have the right to place them in a metaphorical state out of the same scriptures? Uh, do they have a right to move it around wherever they want to? Uh, does not each prophecy explain itself and say what's going to happen during the time and how it will end. And uh, God even said uh, concerning uh, uh, Babylon that he was, he was using that as two things. Number one, he was going to punish his own people. And at the end of that, he already had plans to punish the people that put him in captivity because mm. he already had a problem with them. Yeah. And uh, that's what you call killing two birds with one stone. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but see, when you are determined to, well, I just got, a, a, I understand love and I know a loving God would never do that. 
Well, you got to understand that if he's God, he'll do whatever the hell he wants to do. Mm. You can't call him God and say, this is my definition of him and him still be God. Yeah. Uh, the, the issue with all future prophecies, it is not our right to tell you that God's going to come and judge and going to do this and that's going to change or that you're going to get a parking spot at Walmart or whatever, because it's not in there. Mm. It's just not there. Michael, um, we have posted, and by the time this uh, podcast come out, this should be um, posted and readily available on the website as an article. Mm, I hope so. Michael, you you did an article about the um, connection between the Hebrew scriptures and the thousand-year reign of Christ. Uh, yes. And uh, you and I, uh, this is a result of the work that you and I have done together and a result of all the research. So, Michael, how about I read this? Uh, This is the origins of the Hebrew language and reliability of the scriptures. By Michael Lilborn Williams, Daniel Thomas Rouse, and the Gospel Revolution, Mike Williams Ministries. When was the Hebrew language first written in its 22 characters? This question invites us to explore a fascinating intersection between linguistic development, cultural transmission, and the remarkable preservation of the Hebrew scriptures. Archaeological, historical, and scientific insights converge to reveal a profound story of survival and reliability, even in the face of what should have been overwhelming odds. The Emergence of the Hebrew Alphabet The Hebrew alphabet, which consists of 22 characters, is thought to have developed around the 10th century BCE according to the reign of King David and Solomon. Prior to this, Proto-Synatic and Proto-Canaanite scripts laid the foundation for Semitic alphabets. But it was during the establishment of the Israelite monarchy that Paleo-Hebrew, an early form of Hebrew writing, emerged in a distinctive, recognizable alphabet. The timeline here is significant the period around 1000 BCE. (laughs) I'm sorry, that just excites me every time I read it. (laughs) (laughs) The period around 1000 BCE marks the beginning of Israel's monarchy and a time when a centralized government and formalized religious practices were developing. This was also, as some interpretations suggest, that would be us, <laughs> the start of a 1,000-year prophetic reign of Christ, a symbolic period understood to span from David's rule to the time of Jesus. The formalization of the Hebrew language into 22-character alphabet at this time provided Israel with the means to document its histories, laws, and covenant with God. Oral Tradition Before Written Records While written Hebrew began to emerge around 1000 BCE, the stories, teachings, and laws central to Israelite uh, identity existed long before this in oral tradition. Oral traditions in the ancient world were not casual or loosely held narratives. Instead, they involved highly structured forms of recitation and memorization where elders passed down accounts to younger generations with a focus on exact wording and even inflection. The Hebrew oral tradition would have emphasized precision to ensure that the theological and historical integrity of these accounts. Rather than merely memorizing stories, communities likely rehearsed these accounts communally with strict controls to maintain accuracy. The rigorous approach to oral transmission supports the argument that the content of the Hebrew scriptures could be preserved with remarkable fidelity even over centuries. Empirical evidence supporting the Genesis account. One common argument against the reliability of the Hebrew scriptures is that they were dependent on oral tradition before being written down, which critics claim could lead to distortions or inaccuracies. However, empirical evidence exists that validates the scriptures, particularly the early accounts in Genesis. 
Several elements within Genesis align with findings that were only scientifically valid thousands of years later. Long Human Lifespans and Atmospheric Conditions Genesis describes human lifespans reaching almost 1,000 years before the flood. This level of longevity would require an environment with stable, enriched atmospheric conditions, something vastly different from what we experience today. Interestingly, scientific models suggest that a denser, more stable atmosphere in ancient times could theoretically support longer lifespan. The Genesis account's description of a stable environment fits the scientific possibility, adding credibility to oral traditions. Preservation of the ancient conditions. Number two, dinosaurs and reptilian growth. Genesis does not mention dinosaurs by name, but it describes creatures that may fit their characteristics. Reptiles grow continuously throughout their lifespan, and in an ancient atmosphere that favored extended growth, these creatures could have reached massive sizes aligning with what we understand as dinosaurs today. This account implies an environment and ecosystem distinct from modern conditions supporting a world in which dinosaurs could thrive. Number three, distinct ecosystems. The Genesis account suggests that humans and these large creatures would not have lived in close proximity supporting the scientific observation that human and dinosaur fossils are not found together. Genesis implicitly points to separate ecosystems which would account for the absence of fossils overlapping between humans and dinosaurs. The distinct ecosystems Genesis describes align with scientific findings reinforcing the reliability of oral tradition. Number four, the fountains of the deep and subterranean water. Genesis describes the fountains of the deep breaking open during the flood which seems purely mythological until recent discoveries. In 2014, scientists found evidence of vast subterranean water reservoirs beneath the Earth's crust, a discovery remarkably similar to Genesis' description. The presence of the substantial water supply within the Earth's mantle was completely unknown in ancient times, Yet the Genesis account describes this feature, lending empirical support to its accuracy. The Tradition to Written Form During the Davidic Reign The transition of these oral accounts into written form coincided with the Davidic Reign, a period marked by centralized leadership, formalized worship, and the establishment of Israel's identity as a covenant people. With the advent of the 22-character Paleo-Hebrew alphabet, these accounts were finally recorded, preserving the oral tradition in a durable form. This timing also bears sig symbolic significance. Just as Israel was uniting under a king, its sacred traditions were taken written form, ensuring continuity throughout the centuries of exile, conquest, and dispersion. Written Hebrew preserved the precise detail of the oral tradition now solidified within the structure of a single authoritative text. Statistical Probability of Preserving Accuracy In today's world, the likelihood of preserving accuracy over generations of oral transmission is statistically improbable. Each retelling, especially over centuries, would likely introduce errors. Studies on memory transmission indicate that stories or information degrade Within just a few generations, given the approximate 30 to 40 generations that would have passed from the time of early humanity to the reign of David around 1000 BCE, the probability of retaining the exact content and detail in an oral tradition would statistically would approach one in billions. Mm. Empirical evidence and statistical improbability. improbability the consistency between Genesis and empirical evidence spanning human lifespans, atmospheric conditions, ancient ecosystems, and subterranean water source indicates a level of accuracy that is incredibly unlikely to result from mere chance. Each point of scientific confirmation strengthens the case for a divinely preserved tradition.
the sheer improbability of an oral history maintaining such specificity over centuries add weight to the Hebrew scriptures as a uniquely reliable account. The role of oral traditions and the transition to written records. Rather than undermining the credibility of the Hebrew scriptures, the long period of oral, oral transmission before written strengthens their significance. Unlike written records, oral traditions in ancient times focused heavily on preserving the exact wording and the inflection of each account, ensuring that its meanings and emphasis remained intact. The Hebrew oral tradition's strict controls and content made it less likely to alter even over hundreds of years. The fidelity is visible in the consistency of ancient narratives found in Genesis, as well as in the historical and theological coherence seen in other books like Job. The commitment to accuracy within oral tradition preserved across generations, then solidified in the Hebrew alphabet during David's reign, aligns with a deliberate intention to maintain the covenant history of Israel and the foundational truths of human origins. Why this timeline matters. The development of written Hebrew around 1000 BCE during the reign of David can be seen as part of a broader narrative within Israel's history and theological framework. Number one, beginning of the thousand year reign. If the reign of David represents the beginning of the prophetic 1000 year period culminating in Christ, then the formalization of the Hebrew scriptures during this time reflects a providential alignment. By moving from oral to written form at the critical moment, these texts became a permanent record that would last until the arrival of Jesus who claimed to fulfill them. Number two, preparation for fulfillment. Jesus' statement in John 5.39, search the scriptures for in them you find me, becomes profoundly significant in this context. The Hebrew texts preserved throughout centuries would cover the entire prophetic period of the 1,000-year reign of Christ, maintaining a coherent narrative from in the beginning to the Messianic promises fulfilled in the New Testament. Endurance and Universality The Hebrew scriptures, written and preserved with incredible precision, were not only for Israel, but were intended to stand as a testimony to humanity. The transition from oral tradition to written form during David's era ensured that these accounts would endure despite the challenges of exile, cultural, cultural shifts, and language changes. Conclusion A Unique Testimony to Historical and Spiritual Accuracy The Hebrew scriptures, beginning with oral tradition and formalized into a written alphabet during David's reign, represents an extraordinarily reliable record of human origins, Israelite history, and the divine interaction with humanity. The statistical improbability of preserving such detail, particularly in the, ele in the elements like long human lifespan, atmospheric descriptions, and subterranean water sources confirmed by modern science, highlights the exceptional nature of these scriptures. While most ancient oral traditions evolve or diminish over time, the Hebrew scriptures appear to have been uniquely preserved with a degree of accuracy unmatched by any other ancient text. In light of the 1,000-year prophetic period, beginning with David and transitioning through to Christ, these scriptures stand a profound testament to divine preservation, historical consistency, and spiritual fulfillment. The prob probability of maintaining this level of accuracy over millennia, estimated at one in billions, make the Hebrew scriptures not only a religious text, but also a remarkable artifact of human and divine history. As such, they continue to be a source of insight, inspiration, and scholarly interest, underscoring their enduring legacy and the extraordinary care with which they were transmitted and preserved. Daniel, that uh, article, the one thing that I relied completely on uh, AI, uh, you and I, uh, we, as we went through all this, was 
I didn't know the statistical probabilities. So <laughs> yeah, we, we took all of this information and asked AI, what is the statistical probabilities of people uh, living in the times they did uh, being able to come up with what is now proven uh, conditions uh, right up to 2014. Mm. You see, we could not have written this article as absolute con the consistency of the Genesis account that did come from oral tradition. There was none of this that was written down. Uh, uh, the part that was written down started with uh, King David. So all of this was oral tradition up to this point, and the controls over it was just. Uh, uh, just uh, there's nothing that we have today. Uh, I doubt computer uh, languages would have the ability to do this because the thing that that fascinated me as I was doing the research about it was that it emphasized that even the inflection, mm -hmm. if a word went up, and you in your years of rehearsing, yeah, even communally, they didn't just pass this on to the scribes, but the scribes had to stand up and then rehearse it. And the entire nation of Israel had to uh, say all of this with all of the proper inflection. So it wasn't like this news was passed in, through this secret society. Uh, this information was passed to the entire nation of Israel. And the quality control did go on through a small group of people, but then the entire nation of Israel had to uh, to recite this with inflections accurately in place to tell the story with the meanings mm -hmm. that are within the words. So not just the words were brought. I began to realize that actual verbal communication is if you can accurately take it from one person to the next, to the next, to the next, is actually the most accurate account of history. The problem is that we don't pass on the inflections. We don't pass on the importance. We don't pass on the drama. <laughs> we don't pass those things on. Uh, I was telling Daniel uh, uh, a difficulty that I had with one of my uh, family members several years ago. And uh, I remember when she was, she was very, very mad at me. And when she got ready to leave, I told her, I said, you know, I says, have a nice day or, or make sure you drive safe. And, I, you know, it's just, a, I, I mean, I felt nothing in my, my, in the way that I said it. I, I didn't have anything in my mind other than, you know, drive safely. She had a very uh, windy East Tennessee road to drive on. And I heard it repeated by someone who heard her say it. <laughs> and when she told them, she said, you just wouldn't believe what he did. Said, well, what did he do that was so awful? When I got ready to leave, he said, have a nice, have a nice day and have a, have a safe trip home. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's like, oh, my God, that would have been a horrible thing to say in that tone of voice because that tone of voice says i'm hoping you wreck and kill yourself on the way <laughs> right <home." laughs> mm. but see the 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 traditions that happened they that didn't happen to anything that was passed down orally mm. uh, it was it was finely tuned and the entire nation had to participate while there were uh, professionals uh, doing the work uh, it was passed on to the entire nation. I also want to bring up this uh, interesting point that I just realized as she was reading through this, that everything after David, the, all of these, all of this Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Psalms, all of this is written. Mm. Uh, this was, this didn't have to be passed down through the oral tradition but this is all written. But then they developed a language that included the inflections in the way the language was written. Mm -hmm. That's the detail with which the Hebrew language was developed 
was so that it would pass along the inflections. And that's why there's even numerical value given to each letter. Numerical value is given to each word uh, was because it had to make up for, let, let me say this correctly, it had to make up for what might be lost in the oral tradition. It had to have all of these other safeguards and these uh, points where the, the inflections were said correctly built into the written language itself. Mm. You know, Michael, even to this day, some of the uh, Jewish tradition is to memorize the first five books of the Bible, also known as mm. the Torah. Yeah, I still do it. Yeah. But again, these were, um, in, in that time, they were professionals and they were very precise. And any, any discrepancies, they just, they had to start all over again. Well, and now uh, a scribe is still under that as far as the written. Mm. Uh, they have to do this with a certain quill, with a certain ink. Uh, all of it. This isn't just, hey, you know, I ran out of ink. Would you run down Walmart and pick me up a pen? Uh, this, uh, the, the scriptures told them that it had it laid out for them exactly what they were to write with, exactly how. Uh, uh, the uh, characters would be formed. And some of them is just the tiniest difference in them. It's amazing. And then, like I said, you had the numerical composition to it. Uh, so all of the Torahs that are read in the synagogues are handwritten. And it can take years for one to be written. Mm. You know, Michael, and just what we went through today, just these couple prophecies, and and what is the point of us looking at the numbers again is to show the literal 1,000 year reign of Christ, yeah. the literal 70 weeks of Daniel, of course, with the three and a half um, years cut off and the literal 400 years of bondage to Egypt, the literal 70 years of bondage to Babylon and all of that being consistently prophesied to the detail of who would be reigning during the time such as Nebuchadnezzar. And showing now the tradition of the how the Hebrew scriptures were brought to us in the form that we have it today and how that has stood the test of time. All of this is just to show you that the source that we're working from for our information is a stable source. It's been consistent and it's the chances of it being <laughs> wrong is one in billions. One in billions. And uh, that was not our determination, that part of this article. Uh, we had to depend on an artificial brain to come up with that uh, based on the evidence that we presented in this article. Mm. Wow. Well, Michael, I don't know what is next for us, but I am sure happy that we are on this journey of understanding the 1,000-year reign of Christ, of course, substantiating the validity of the Hebrew Scriptures, and uh, this was a, a fun practice today, walking through these prophecies that had timestamps on them and seeing how precise they were. Mm -hmm. And we'll get this published for you in every form. We want to send it out in a newsletter to you, publish it on Facebook. We're going to really try to make this very prominent where it's seen and easily read by all. And so it is. We must leave you, family and friends. If you'd like to know anything about the Gospel Revolution, then call our office on 832-318-9339. And be sure to participate in the Pledge Drive. You can also go to www.gospelrevolution.com and hit the Donate button. You can find us on your favorite social media network, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Please be sure to hit that subscribe, share, and like button on whatever platform you are listening. Now it's good night from Daniel Rouse in the frozen tundra. And it's good night from Michael Williams right here in the uh, room of rooms. I think you saw on Tuesday night some of the changes. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting her all dressed up and ready for a tour. Uh, I want to show you uh, what I see when I'm here as if anybody's interested. But just in case, uh, I, I love this place, folks. And, and you guys provided it for me. I suppose that's why I want to show it to you is because it is your 
funds that has made this room possible. Oh my gosh, it's so nice. We sure hope that you enjoyed today's PowerCast. And remember, we'll be here to do the same thing all over again next week, only better. Since you're knocking on the door, you're begging to come in, yeah. On a wet that all the wild love's been knocking from within. You are the love you see. A perfect that you need, right? Gotta be nothing to complete. It's not a thing that you need, y'all. The love. Just remember to breathe and take a second off. Look, I'm just trying to remind you yeah, that you're perfectly divine. All is the desire. Deconstructing religion and barbecuing the sacred cows of Christianity before your very eyes. You are listening to The Gospel Revolution.